Hi, this is JT Manava with Like Other Animals, a program that explains who people take after. Thanks to our official ticket supplier, online booking service Anyway, Any Day, we traveled to the most remote part of Indonesia, the island of Borneo, real Indonesian jungle. We came here to research why humans are naked monkeys. Well, the monkey part is simple, as our species is Homo sapiens, the genus is Homo, the family is Hominidae, the suborder is Haplorhini, and the order is primates. But why are we naked? There are three main hypotheses that explain why humans lost body hair. The first one is called the aquatic ape hypothesis. This theory says that our ancestors didn't leave forests for the savanna, but moved to the banks and shores of rivers, lakes and seas. And there they adopted a semi-aquatic way of life. We to help them hide from predators, provided humans with food, seaweed, fish and other seafood. This diet was very high in phosphorus and iodine, which was quite beneficial for brain development. The habit to hang out in the water-covered littoral zone formed our preference for walking upright. Spending a lot of time in the water stripped us of fur, because wet monkey fur is of no use to anyone at all. In return, we increased subcutaneous fat, which is a must in the water. It improved both our buoyancy and thermal insulation. Therefore, our propensity for obesity, our downward pointing nostrils, our rudimentary membranes between the fingers, our innate ability to swim, our love for water landscapes, and even our passion for beach holidays, they are all links of a single chain, at least according to the aquatic ape theory. We would happily agree with this theory if the real aquatic monkeys didn't live right here, in this wonderful jungle. The cutest endemic animal in Borneo is the proboscis, or long-nosed monkey. The locals call them orang bilanda, which means a Dutchman. Because they, well, I shouldn't probably say it in front of our Dutch director, but they look like Dutchmen indeed. Check out this nose, this belly, these sideburns, and their habit to live exclusively next to water. Unlike other monkeys, proboscis can swim and dive really well. They can even swim up to 20 meters underwater while holding their breath. This river presents an insurmountable obstacle for orangutans, macaques, langurs, and even for clouded leopards that hunt all of the above. But the long-nosed monkeys easily overcome this obstacle and go back and forth all the time. They move on two legs in the water, and their nostrils are indeed pointing down, and in general everything about them aligns perfectly well with the aquatic ape hypothesis. Except for the most important thing. Proboscis monkeys have magnificent, thick, red, Dutch fur, and they show no signs that they are planning to get rid of that fur. In general, mammals that adopted the semi-aquatic lifestyle did not lose their hair, except for hippos that are not closely related to us. On the contrary, their fur became thicker and denser. That's why, although free divers and water birth adepts love the aquatic ape hypothesis, scientists remain rather skeptical. And that's not because there are criminally few freedivers or water birth adepts among scientists. The second hypothesis was mentioned in our video on trypophobia. It claims that we lost our fur in the battle against skin parasites. And if you think that this is a rather frivolous reason, then you simply haven't encountered active parasites in a tropical climate. They are a nightmare in themselves, but diseases they spread are even worse. So we needed to fight parasites by all means. And of course, it's much easier to get rid of them with bare skin. Who's there? Oh, what a huge orangutan! It won't be able to get across the river, unlike a proboscis monkey. Anyway, if you are naked, it's much easier to show to the opposite sex that your skin is clear of parasites. Yeah, baby, my skin is so lovely and clean. You should check out my genes. Darwin himself thought that the reduction of fur in humans could be the result of sexual selection. And sexual selection is so powerful that it can turn even a bald damn thing into a genetic trend. Quite possibly, this is what happened to us humans. There is one more argument in favor of the parasite hypothesis. In fact, our fur didn't really disappear. Modern humans have exactly the same number of hair follicles as monkeys of comparable size. 
Our hairs became thinner, less noticeable, but we still have them all. What's the point of having the hair in this deteriorated state? Let's make an experiment. Let's take this furry paw and remove all body hair. Awful! A sheep is easier to shear than this. We can need gloves now. Or socks. After we have completely removed hair from the skin, we can test its sensitivity. Here is the test. Something is crawling. Feels like something is crawling. Definitely, I can feel it. Here I can feel nothing at all. Lack of body hair reduces skin sensitivity to delicate movements, because our hairs act as seismic sensors, kind of micro-vibrisi. They help our sense of touch to detect even the smallest movements. And who makes these smallest movements? The ectoparasites, of course. By the way, the familiar hysterical reaction to the sensation of an insect crawling on your skin is probably part of the total package of our anti-parasite adaptations. And finally, we replaced the lost fur with fire and clothes to protect ourselves from the cold. Most probably, the processes of fur loss and technological developments were happening simultaneously and might have even stimulated each other. This answers the question, why haven't other animals lost their fur if being naked is so great? It just so happens that in order to be as naked as humans, one needs to become as clever as humans. What's it over there? And finally, the third hypothesis, the most beautiful and heroic one, in my opinion. We lost our fur to cool down more efficiently while running. You'd probably be quite surprised, but for a couple of million years now, humans have been absolute world champions in running. But only in long-distance running, during the day and in hot climate. Under these rather unpleasant circumstances, no animal can match humans. And here is why. When our ancestors had just left the forest, they began their career as scavengers, competing with hyenas. But after a while they found their own unique niche. Everyone who's been to the savanna knows that during daytime all life stops there and everybody hides in the shade. Daytime predators, such as cheetahs, can hunt when it's hot, but they need to date really quickly, otherwise they can overheat instantly. So their potential victims know that, and they accelerate to escape. A minute or two of chasing and running, and then it's all quiet again at Ngoro Ngoro. This is where humans spotted their main competitive advantage. When we humans left the forest for the savanna, we could walk on two legs, at least according to Owen Lovejoy. So all we needed was to remove fur from the body, grow more hair on the head, it became our shield against the harsh equatorial sun, preventing our precious brain from overheating. On the other hand, we had to increase the number of sweat glands. Because, much to the delight of deodorant manufacturers, man is the sweatiest animal in the world. This is how humans acquired a super-efficient cooler. And finally, our defining feature. When running vertically, we use our abdomen to cool down, the body part mainly responsible for heat exchange. If you don't believe it, you can conduct the following simple experiment. If you are cold at night and you don't have any more blankets, simply turn on your stomach or cover it up with a pillow. You'll get warm really quickly. By the way, this is one of the most valuable discoveries I've made in my life. The cooling process follows the same principle. When you cool down the stomach, you cool down the whole body. In addition, running a marathon on two legs turned out to be much more energy efficient than running on all four. For example, modern bushmen still hunt antelopes this way. They just run after the animal all day until it falls over with its tongue sticking out, and they can pick it up barehanded. By the way, this is the only kind of hunting I could have admiration for. But never mind the bushman, any runner in a park knows that blissful feeling that comes after about 20 minutes of running. You feel like you can keep running forever. 
Of course, after about half an hour, that feeling passes, but for 30 minutes, you are the king of the savanna. And of course, this theory might lead to a speculation that some mountain tribes are so hairy because there is nowhere to run in the mountains. Anyway, it's clear that the endurance running hypothesis is not a myth created by sponsors of African marathon runners. This hypothesis has a solid evidence base, and it beautifully complements the parasite hypothesis. They don't contradict each other at all, so probably we became naked both in order to cool down and to scratch ourselves. Less. Evolution enjoys inventing such multifunctional adaptations, killing many birds with one stone. Well, these are the main hypotheses. If you didn't have enough, please read the comments below, where I'm sure you can find many more exciting ideas. Or write your own version why we lost our fur and we'll award the best idea with the Dawkins Prize. You can find more details about it in the video description. This was like other animals. Bye. <laughs> I think, actually, rumors about hair reduction in humans are strongly exaggerated. I'm afraid our program is losing its relevance with every second, actually. I don't feel anything at all. Seriously. <laughs> Did we have to cut off your hand, probably? I don't feel anything at all. Should be easy for you to have your teeth pulled.